Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Robert Lustig. Most of you probably have heard of Dr. Lustig's work. He did a famous talk called The Bitter Truth. I will link to all of his talks in the show notes. And he has done a lot of research on fatty liver disease, especially with children, and what excess or added sugar does to the body. Dr. Robert Lustig is an American pediatric endocrinologist. He's a professor emeritus of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology at the University University of California, San Francisco. He specializes in neuroendocrinology and childhood obesity. Dr. Lustig has many, many viral talks such as The Sugar, The Bitter Truth, The Hacking of the American Mind, as well as The Fat Chance Fructose 2.0. If you haven't watched any of Dr. Lustig's talks, you can find them on YouTube and they have so much good information and it breaks down the molecular level of how fructose gets absorbed and used in the body and how it can actually cause harm just like alcohol does. In our conversation, we talk through why fructose isn't ideal, why ultra processed foods aren't ideal. And we talk about nuances and details about nutrition and how we should look at food and whether it's a foe or a friend to our wellness. Dr. Lustig talks in detail about fruit and fruit juice and why fruit may not be that bad and why juice is not ideal. He talks about fruit juice versus soda. And he also talks about fruit, how maybe it is okay for a lot of people, But if you are diabetic, it may be a different story. I love that Dr. Lustig is very diet agnostic, but really talks about how food or the processed foods are essentially injuring us to be sick and unwell and how it's actually intentional by the food industry. This conversation is so eye-opening, even for me, as to how we should look at nutrition and not just about nutrient density, but what it's doing to our cells and our cell structure And if every food we're consuming is supporting our liver, our brain function, and our metabolic health. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Robert Lustig. I'm so excited to have you on. A big fan of your work. I watched The Bitter Truth on YouTube many, many years ago, and I've been such a big fan. You really introduced me and made my eyes open to the dangers of excess sugar and fructose. So for the people that are listening and watching, you can introduce yourself. Sure. First of all, um, let me introduce myself. I'm Rob. I am not Dr. Lustig. Um, I am not your doctor. (laughs) Um, And I am now clinically retired. So even more so. Um, I used to be a pediatric neuroendocrinologist. I'm an emeritus professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I uh, stopped seeing patients about five years ago so I could concentrate on policy and advocacy and, um, you know, trying to fix the problem. And I realized that I could take care of a million kids easier than I could take care of one. So um, I sort of shifted gears and have it look back. So my, uh, you know, my, my story is I came at this through the back door. Um, I was not a um, nutrition Nazi. Uh, I, you know, went into pediatric endocrinology to take care of short kids. And then the short kids got fat on me. Um, Many, many years ago, I worked at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, the pediatric cancer hospital. And I had inherited a cadre of about 40 Uh, children who had survived their brain tumors only to become massively obese. Now, this form of intractable obesity after treatment of a brain tumor was well known, called hypothalamic obesity. It had been described by Freelich and Babinski back in 1901, but no one knew what to do for them. And it had been shown that you can lock these kids up in a room, throw away the key, and feed them 500 calories a day, and they would still gain weight. And the reason is because they would rather store it than burn it. Now, 
we knew that these kids put out an enormously high amount of the hormone insulin. And so I asked the question many, many years ago, what if we got these kids' insulins down? Because insulin is the energy storage hormone. When your insulin's high, pretty much what you eat goes to fat for storage because that's insulin's job. So we did a study where we gave kids a medicine that would block insulin release at the level of the pancreas. And lo and behold, these kids started losing weight. But something even more remarkable happened. They started exercising spontaneously. And that was something we had not predicted, was that it would change their behavior. Right. And the kids would say things like, this is the first time my head hasn't been in the cloud since the tumor. And the parents would say, I've got my kid back. You know, this was really remarkable. And we ended up doing a double blind placebo control trial and the same thing happened. And then we asked the question, okay, this is true for kids with brain tumors. Could it be true for adults without brain tumors? Then lo and behold, we, so we did a study and lo and behold, 20%, only 20% of the uh, adults that we treated with the same medicine did the exact same thing. They lost weight and they started exercising spontaneously. And when we look back at who those 20% were, they were the people who released the most insulin. Hmm. So this said to me that biochemistry drives behavior. And as a neuroendocrinologist, I was very prepared to believe that because I've been seeing that kind of thing throughout my entire career. You know, estrogen and androgen changes behavior at puberty. Glucocorticoids change behavior. You know, all different hormones change behavior. It's why I went into neuroendocrinology. So I've been trumpeting this, uh, uh, you know, thesis that the biochemistry comes first and that insulin's the bad guy in this story ever since. And it looks like it's uh, uh, turned out to be true. I know that a lot of your work comes into fructose. So what made you start digging into fructose? Is it because of its effect on insulin? If you can kind of delve into that a little bit. 20% of the adult population responded to this drug that suppressed insulin release. So I said, well, what about the other 80%? Now they had high insulin levels too, but the drug didn't suppress it. And the reason because the drug worked right at the pancreas. It was very clear that these patients with the high insulins that didn't respond, they had a problem at the liver. They couldn't clear the insulin. They had liver insulin resistance. So the question is, where'd that come from? And why does 80% of the population have it when they didn't used to? So in 2006, I was asked to give a talk at the NIH about what I thought was the primary driver of obesity and metabolic syndrome. And I thought to myself, all right, how am I gonna approach this? And I said, well, let's look at kids as canaries in the coal mine. Kids today get two diseases that they never got before, type two diabetes, and fatty liver disease. Right. Okay, these are diseases that used to be the diseases of aging, but kids aren't old. These are diseases that used to be the diseases of alcohol, but kids don't drink alcohol. So I said, okay, what are kids exposed to that can act like aging and can act like alcohol? So I opened up my biochemistry textbook from 1974 from college and I opened it up to alcohol and there on the next page was the answer, sugar. The molecule fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, the molecule that makes it delightful, the molecule that makes it addictive, right. turns out Fructose is metabolized in the liver and in the brain exactly like alcohol. 
And it makes sense that that would be the case because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called wine. We do it in Napa and Sonoma every day. The big difference between the two is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step of metabolism, which is called glycolysis. For fructose, we do our own first step. But after that, they're the same. In terms of how the mitochondria of your cells, the little energy burning factories inside your cells, see it, they don't know the difference. And what this turns out to be, both in terms of alcoholism and in terms of sugar, is mitochondrial overload. The inability of mitochondria to process all of the energy. And so what it does is it throws off the rest as fat. And that's why alcohol gives you fatty liver disease. And that's why sugar gives you fatty liver disease. So I went to this NIH meeting and I said, I think that sugar is causing the same detriments as alcohol through these mechanisms and for this reason. And they tackled me. The toxicologist tackled me in the uh, uh, ante room, in, to, you know, in, the, in the lobby of the, of the uh, theater where the talk was going on and said, oh my God, you're right. You're right. You have to tell everyone about this. And so we have since done many studies looking at the role of sugar in the genesis of liver fat and insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And we have shown that when you get the sugar out of the diet, you can reverse it in children, in adults, in everyone. And so then came the question, well, why is there so much sugar in our food? Right. And that is where the advocacy came in because it's now clear that the food industry knows. They get it. They know why they're adding the sugar to the food in the same way that the tobacco industry up the nicotine content of their cigarettes to keep us all hooked. Well, this is tobacco all over again. And so I've had to become not just a researcher, not just a clinician, but in fact, a policy wonk and an advocate too. I saw the recent food recommendations, and I think they were trying to lower the sugar recommendations as in the um, allowment. And initially, it was higher than when they released it. And when they finally released it, they only dropped it, I think, like two percentage points. I, I don't know if you saw that, but I did. Is, is it the, like, why is that? If we know there's a lot of literature on sugar, is it really the food industry that has that strong of a hold? Absolutely. The food, the food industry has an amazing hold on Congress and an amazing hold on the USDA. And so they will not make a move without the food industry's uh, approval. And this is not just true for the USDA. This is true for the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority as well. The bottom line is there's a lot of money riding on this. Right. And so people do not want to give up the goose that laid the golden eggs, despite the fact that those golden eggs are toxic. Right. In all of your studies with fructose, uh, there's a lot of people that will argue that fructose is only dangerous if it's coming from high fructose corn syrup from sodas, um, maybe some of the fruit juice juices with the absorption rate but otherwise that natural fructose is not harmful and that any study really done on fructose is primarily with rodents. I know that you've done studies on humans. And so if you can talk a little bit about how fructose, the molecule itself can be harmful and it's not just the high fructose corn syrup. Right. So when I talk about sugar, I am talking about dietary sugar. Okay. I'm talking about sucrose or high fructose corn syrup or maple syrup, honey, or agave. We're talking about caloric sweeteners that have one glucose and one fructose. The difference between sucrose and high fructose corn syrup is that the glucose and the fructose are bound together. 
and high fructose corn syrup, they're free. That's the difference. The enzyme in your intestine, sucrase, cleaves that bond in about a nanosecond. You absorb the two molecules equally. So from a purely biochemical, digestive, absorptive, and mitochondrial standpoint, there is no difference between sucrose and high fructose corn syrup. The big difference between the two is economic because high fructose corn syrup is homegrown, because high fructose corn syrup is made from corn, which is cheaper, because high fructose corn syrup is miscible because it's already in liquid form. So you can add more to different foods and get people to buy more. Therefore, it is cheaper. And because it's cheaper, the food industry can add more to uh, other foods and get you to buy more. And it doesn't cost them as much. Right. So high fructose corn syrup's not more biochemically evil than sucrose. It is more economically evil than sucrose. But sucrose does exactly the same things as high fructose corn syrup. Pretty much high fructose corn syrup is restricted to the United States, Japan, and certain parts of Europe. Mm. Okay. But the rest of the world has metabolic syndrome. The rest of the world has obesity. The rest of the world has type two diabetes also, and they don't have high fructose corn syrup, but they have sucrose. Right. So there's really no difference between the two. And anyone who says, oh, it's the high fructose corn syrup is missing the point. It is true that high fructose corn syrup instigated the, the, switch to sugar part of many, many different uh, consumer packaged goods companies because it was cheaper. But purely from a biochemical standpoint, the fructose molecule is the fructose molecule wherever it occurs. Sure. The molecule is the molecule. There's nothing different about the molecule. And therefore, there's nothing different about the detriments of the molecule itself. Now, having said that, Whole fruit is not the same as fruit juice. Fruit juice has sucrose. Whole fruit has sucrose. But whole fruit's not the problem, but fruit juice is. And you say, wait a second, you just said they were the same molecule. Right. Yeah, they're the same molecule if you absorb them. If you don't absorb them, then they're not the same molecule because you didn't absorb it. And that's the key to whole fruit because whole fruit has fiber. Fiber is the antidote to sugar. What fiber does, and you need soluble and insoluble fiber. Whole fruit has both. So soluble fiber is like pectins or inulin, like what holds jelly together. Insoluble fibers like cellulose, like the stringy stuff in celery. Right. Okay. Whole fruit has both. And what happens is that the insoluble fiber, the cellulose, forms a lattice work on the inside of your intestine, like a fishnet. And the soluble fiber, which are globular, plug the holes in the fishnet. And together they form an impenetrable secondary barrier that limits absorption in the duodenum, in the early part of the intestine. And so you don't spike your glucose, therefore you don't spike your insulin, therefore you don't gain weight, and you stay insulin sensitive. Now, if you didn't absorb it early, then it goes further down the intestine to the next part called the jejunum, and that's where the bacteria are, the microbiome, and they have to eat. So they will chew up that sugar if you didn't absorb it early. And if they chew it up, it's like you didn't get it. So even though it passed your lips, if you didn't absorb it, you didn't get it. So when you consume sugar as whole fruit, but if you consume it as fruit juice, where the insoluble fiber has been removed or decimated by a Vitamix blade, 
Okay. Now you can't set up that gel. Now you can't inhibit that absorption. Now you're going to absorb it. Now you're going to peak your glucose. Now you're going to peak your insulin. Now you're going to get all the same detriments that a Coca-Cola would. So the rule is eat your fruit, don't drink it. Do you think that there is a certain amount of fruit? For example, uh, mangoes are very, very high in fructose. Same with some of the other tropical fruits. Do yeah. you think that there is a limit with certain fruits that are higher in fructose? Or do you think they're all protected with those fibers? Right. So if you do a scattergram, okay. on the x-axis, you have amount of fructose. And on the y-axis, you have amount of fiber. Mm. Pretty much, with two exceptions, all the fruits that are available are going to be on a correlation line. So the more fructose something has, the more fiber it also has. Perfect example of this, sugar cane. Okay? It's got the most fructose of all. It's a stick. <laughs> You can't even chew the damn thing, right. right? Now, if you crystallize it, you know, if you boil it and crystallize it and turn it into, you know, five pound bags of sugar, you know, of purified sugar, that's a different story. But sugar cane itself is not dangerous mm -hmm. until you process it. So whole fruit, pretty much any whole fruit with two exceptions, the more fructose, the more fiber. And mangoes certainly fit that uh, category. Mangoes, you have to use a knife to be able to cut through them. Papayas, you have to be able to use a knife to cut through them. Pineapples, you have to be able to use a knife to cut through them. Okay? Try to eat a pineapple without a knife. Good luck. All right? With two exceptions. Grapes, they're just little bags of sugar. Right. And bananas. And, you know, it's easy to mash a banana. You don't need a knife to mash a banana. All right. So they have more sugar than fiber, mm. but pretty much all the other fruits have more fiber than sugar. In general, I do not have an upper limit okay. for fruit consumption, except for grapes and bananas. What's interesting is um, sometimes I work with type two diabetics. And so the only thing they'll leave in their diet is fruit. And their blood sugar still goes up enough that they cannot reverse the, I guess, the higher levels of insulin. And so it's not until they remove any form of fruits uh, or limit it to just the lower glycemic ones like berries that they can actually reduce their insulin enough. Would you? I, I agree with that. You know, okay. the, bottom, the bottom line is that diabetes mm. is extreme glucose intolerance. Right. It is not just insulin resistance. If you have type two diabetes, the goal is keep your blood glucose down mm -hmm. and keep your insulin down. So what makes insulin go up and what makes glucose go up? Refined carbohydrate and sugar. And unfortunately fruit has some refined carbohydrate and sugar in it. So for type two diabetics, they have to be a little bit more mindful and they have to be a little bit more careful. Okay. I totally agree with that. Right. But in general, yes. whole fruit is self-limiting. Okay. My, my colleague and my cook, cookbook co-author, Cindy Gershon, who we wrote the Fat Chance Cookbook together. She's a uh, nutrition educator in the East Bay here in uh, uh, San Francisco area. And the very first day of class every year, she does the exact same experiment. She takes two kids from the class. And these are kids who are poor, you know, they, uh, mo most of them have not eaten breakfast because they have food insecurity. They don't even get breakfast. Okay. So two kids in the class, she hands each kid six oranges. And she says to the first kid, here, kid, here's six oranges, make juice. And so the kid squeezes the six oranges, gets about 12 ounces of uh, juice, downs the whole 12 ounces and says, okay, what's for breakfast? The second kid, she says, here, kid, here's six oranges. Eat the six oranges. 
Kid Eats Orange number one, mm -hmm. Kid Eats Orange number two, Kid Eats Orange number three, Kid gets to orange number four and throws up. Oh. She's got the vomit basin ready because she knows that's what's going to happen. And she knows it's going to be an orange number four. Mm. And the kid goes, oh, my God, I'm going to die. So what happened? The fiber happened. Mm. The fiber moves the food through the intestine so fast you get the satiety signal much sooner. And so you can't get that fourth orange down, all right? And because of that gel, you're actually not putting stuff through. And so you end up vomiting. And then that kid doesn't eat lunch or dinner either, okay? Because of the fiber. Right. So for the most part, whole fruit is self-limiting. Okay. You can only eat so much of it, with the exception of grapes and bananas. What are your thoughts about dried fruits? So dried fruits are a little bit more energy dense. Obviously, there's no water. Sure. Okay. There's a mechanical effect of the water in the stomach to induce some level of satiety, which you are missing when you're using dried fruit. But the dried fruit still does have the fiber. Mm. So you don't get quite the glucose spike you would from juice. But, you know, you do tend to eat more of it because you don't get that early satiety signal from stomach distension. Okay. You have a study with uh, children that just in nine days that they have really significant metabolic um, changes. Can you talk a little bit about that study and why it's so powerful? Sure. We asked the question back in 2010, initially, is fructose worse than its calories? Okay. Is fructose, because fructose is a preferred lipogenic substrate for the liver, and the liver would rather turn fructose into fat, is fructose worse than its calories? Because if it's just as bad as its calories, then all calories are a problem. Right. We were asking the question, is fructose worse? In order to do that, what we did was we took 43 children from our obesity clinic at UCSF, Latino and African-American, low socioeconomic status, food insecurity, high sugar consumers, high processed food consumers with metabolic syndrome. What we did was we figured out what they were eating at home and we studied them on their home diet. And then for the next nine days, we catered their meals, no added sugar. We took the percent of added sugar in their diet from 28% of calories down to 10% of calories. Wow. We gave them fruit, but that was it. Okay. Everything else was no added sugar. Okay. Now, if you do that, you're going to remove 350 to 400 calories a day out of these kids' diets. And if you do that for 10 days, they might lose weight. We didn't want them to lose weight. Right. We wanted them to stay the same weight. Because if they lost weight and they got better, the critics would say, well, of course they got better. They lost weight. We wanted them to stay the same weight. Every day they'd stand on the scale. And if they were losing weight, eat more. We gave them extra food in order to keep them weight stable right. for the course of the 10 days. So we took the sugar out. And in order to replace mm -hmm. what we took out, we had to give them starch. Mm -hmm calorically equivalent to sugar, but no fructose, just glucose. Starch is polymerized glucose. So we did a starch for sugar exchange in the vernacular. We took the pastries out, we put the bagels in. We put, took the sweetened yogurt out, we put the baked potato chips in. We took the chicken teriyaki out, we put the turkey hot dogs in. 
So we didn't give them good food. We gave them crappy food. We gave them processed food. Sure. We gave them kid food, food kids would eat. Right, right. But it was no added sugar food. And we gave them a scale. And if they were losing weight, eat more. And then we studied them 10 days later on the same number of calories, just no added sugar. Every aspect of their metabolic health got better. Wow. Their fasting insulin went down. Their fasting glucose went down. Their insulin dynamics got better at the level of the pancreas. They had a lactate level at baseline. You're not supposed to, but they did. That went away. Okay. Their bad LDL got better. Their triglycerides got better. Most importantly, their subcutaneous fat didn't change because they didn't lose weight. Mm -hmm. Their visceral fat went down 7%, but their liver fat went down 22%. In nine days. In nine days. And as their liver fat went down, their insulin sensitivity improved, showing that it's what happens at the liver that matters. Mm -hmm. And so fructose is worse because it's fructose, not because it's calories. This was the thing that showed us that a calorie is not a calorie. Right. That the quality of those calories is more important than the quantity of those calories. And this is absolutely essential for being able to make changes in the food environment, is understanding that concept that the quality of the food is more important than the quantity. From that study, it sounds almost like low carb is not necessarily the only answer. It's sounding that it's just really the added sugar. So if you stick to starchy foods, maybe sweet potatoes, foods that have less fructose, are right. you saying with the same, and let's say the grams of carbohydrates are the same, they would still have that metabolic improvement. So for instance, sweet potatoes have way more fiber than regular potatoes. You can actually right. see it. Yes. All right. The fiber in the sweet potatoes is actually a good thing. Right. Now, I am not against low carb. I am not for low carb. <laughs> I am not against low fat. I am not for low fat. Okay. I do not have a dietary ideology. Okay. My only ideology, and it's not ideology because we have the science to prove it. Sure is get the insulin down. Now, there are two ways to get the insulin down. One is don't supply foods that make it go up. Right. That would be low carb. Mm -hmm. And the other is supply foods that prevent its absorption. Right. And that's called high fiber. So what we really need is a low sugar, high fiber diet. That's called real food. Unfortunately, that's not what the food industry is selling. They are selling a high sugar, low fiber diet. And that's called processed food. So processed food is the problem. Real food is the answer. Now, a carnivore diet is real food. A vegan diet can be real food. Or maybe not, because Coca-Cola, Doritos, and Oreos are vegan. Right, right. So just because you're eating vegan doesn't mean you're eating healthy. And actually, to be honest with you, just because you're eating carnivore doesn't mean you're eating healthy either. Fair enough. Okay, it depends on what you're actually consuming. So I think that the people who are vegan and the people who are keto actually have more in common yes. and that they should actually team up together because the enemy of both of them is ultra processed food. And that's where they should be directing their ire, not at each other. I, I agree with that completely. I ran into a vegan family and all of our uh, values and what we believe in society and just you know, the corporate narrative or the food industry, big pharma, all of those, we had the same point of views. It's just our dietary 
our final, I guess, thoughts on dietary changes were different. And, but really it's that what standard care has provided is not working for us. And we're trying to find other ways to heal. And so I I completely agree with that. And I completely agree that we should be having a movement more towards fighting, I guess, big food and big pharma as um, they're the ones that are really making all the people sick with all of this. People always ask me, should I be on low carb or should I be on low fat? And the answer is it depends on your biochemistry. Okay. There are certain people whose um, glucoses will spike inordinately on a low fat, high carb diet. Sure. They probably need a lower carb diet. Now, how can they know who they are? Well, in order to know the answer to that, you need some lab tests and you might even need a continuous glucose monitor in order to know what your spikes look like. And there are companies out there now, and I happen to be an advisor to several of them that are you know, using continuous glucose monitoring to get a handle on your personal biochemical profile. This is the first step in this new concept of personalized nutrition. If you take large populations and you do either low carb or low fat, the answers are the same in terms of the means. Okay, they both work in in the aggregate. Right, right. But they don't necessarily work equally for each individual person. One might work better than the other depending on your own personal biochemical response. Uh, Christopher Gardner at Stanford University showed this in his diet fits study. Uh, Zevi uh, et al. in Cell Metabolism 2015 showed this um, uh, from Elinov's group at, at, in uh, the Weizmann Institute at Rehoboth, Israel. The bottom line is you have to know who you are. Mm-hmm. And there are ways now to know who you are. And I think that ultimately we'll all be wearing a wearable that will give us information on our glucose, on our uh, lactate level, on our ketones, on our insulin level, eventually, that will basically help us navigate the grocery store so that we eat the foods that are metabolically best for us. But in no way, shape, or form should anyone walk away from this or any other talk on nutrition saying, see, I was right, or you're wrong, okay? Because you don't know what's going on with the other person. And you don't even, most of them don't even know what's going on with them. And I think that's what is difficult on the internet of things with advocates because they are really sharing what they have seen work for them, or maybe their population of people that are similar to them. And when I work with a variety of people, I've learned that there's no one answer. And like you said, uh, the CGMs are really powerful to see some people just from excessive exercise through the day will then have a dip in their glucose in the middle of the night, which will cause them to wake up. And it's not because of any carbohydrate consumption. And it takes people like that to share their individual story to make us realize that not every single diet works for every single person. The role of a clinician Mm -hmm. is observation. Okay. And there is nothing wrong with observation, but observation is anecdote and anecdote is not science. What you do is you observe a phenomenon and then you pose the question that has to be answered scientifically. So an N of one is not science. Right. An N of one may give you an idea and that's okay. I've had many N of ones in my career, you know, as a physician that have taken me to the next level of my understanding, informed my research, and that's fine. That's what it's about. But To take an N of one and say, you've got science, that's the mistake. Right, right. And unfortunately, we have a population that 
thinks and in, in ends of one are science. Oh, it worked for me. Therefore, it must be true. Therefore, if you don't do it, then you're the problem. Sure. Okay. And people have gotten very loud and noisy on the internet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I personally think that information about the science of nutrition has really sort of gone out of control. And what we need is a curation, um, you know, to basically keep the, uh, the arguments and the uh, discourse uh, appropriate and measured. And we do not have that at the moment. One of the reasons why nutrition is really hard to get the evidence-based research is because so much of what we can test on people is considered unethical. I don't know if we can ever see some of the science that we saw in the 50s and 1900s when things weren't as unethical to test on people, like well, the Minnesota starvation study, for example. Right. Well, the, the bottom line is that in a sense, we've all been guinea pigs in a grand experiment that we did not provide informed consent to. Sure. That grand experiment ha is, uh, ha has a name, it's two words, processed food. Sure. Okay. There was no experiment. There was no discussion of metabolic perturbations. Okay. The food industry introduced processed food and said, here, the new generation of food. And we bought it hook, line, and sinker. Why did we buy it hook, line, and sinker? Answer, because they put something addictive in the food called sugar. They also put some caffeine in there too, all right, for good measure. Bottom line is, we didn't agree to this experiment, but our entire food supply has been changed, you know, without our knowledge, but with our tacit approval. If you want to talk about science, let's put that to the test. And we are doing that. In fact, several studies around the world, the Nova system from Brazil, the Nutrinet Santé study from Paris, okay, our work, Rick Johnson's work at the University of Colorado, et cetera, um, are all demonstrating the same thing. And that is that processed food leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. And mitochondrial dysfunction leads to insulin resistance. And insulin resistance leads to obesity and chronic disease. That's what we have learned. Right. And we have learned it in a scientifically valid and supportable way. The question is, when do you have enough information to act? That's a question that's worth discussing, that we need a real uh, forum for, not just you and me. But I would argue that we have enough information to act. I know we, you mentioned that the children in nine days, there was a 20% decrease in their fatty liver function. In the general population, let's say adults, how quickly do people start developing fatty liver? So we don't know how quickly they develop it, but we know how quickly they can reverse it. Okay. My colleagues at UCSF and Toro University, Jean-Marc Schwartz, Kathy Mulligan, uh, did this study. They took uh, 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 15 volunteers locked them up on the Clinical Research Center in San Francisco General, and for two weeks at a time, fed them an either high sugar diet or a high complex carbohydrate diet. And these diets were matched for calories, for total carbohydrate, for protein, fat, fiber, et cetera. And what they showed was that on the high sugar diet, those people had 38% more liver fat than when they were on the, high, on the high complex carbohydrate diet. Two weeks, wow. they were able to see massive changes in liver fat. So the bottom line is that liver fat looks like it can be formed relatively rapidly. 
And it also looks like it can go away relatively rapidly. And that's why everyone needs to be aware of what they're eating because type two diabetes and fatty liver disease are eminently reversible. But you have to know what you're doing in order to reverse it. So there's a lot of kids and people that get diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's not a lot of food and dietary recommendations to, because it seems so simple from what you say is get off a lot of this sugar and you could reverse a lot of that. But I don't think most doctors are, that's their first recommendation. No, I I agree because doctors don't know a damn thing about nutrition. Okay. And in my book, Metabolical, this one here, (laughs) um, I have, I devote an entire higher chapter to the doctors and the chapter to the dietitians and to the chapter to the dentists and explain why it is that they don't know this. Why nutrition is not part of the medical curriculum. Only 28% of medical schools in America even have a nutrition curriculum. And those that do, the median number of contact hours is 19.6. When you consider that Uh, a standard medical school uh, uh, curriculum would be 6,000 contact hours. Okay, 19.6 contact hours to solve 75% of disease is pretty ridiculous. Right, right. We doctors are not taught nutrition. The question is why not? Right. The answer to that in the book is because big pharma underwrites the medical curriculum. And big pharma doesn't want nutrition discussed because if nutrition were discussed and people actually use nutrition, then big pharma would not generate big profits. So just to reiterate, so the reason why nutrition is not taught in medical schools, you think it's intentional so that- It's intentional. It's highly intentional. Okay. Okay. That has to change. Do you think it will? Do you think that there will be a tipping point where nutrition will be taught that we will go back to using food as medicine? So the thing you have to remember, and people use this three word meme at this point, food as medicine. Food can be medicine. I'm not saying it's not. Food can be medicine, but food can also be poison. Ultra processed food is not food. Right. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. In order to answer that, okay, then you have to understand what the definition of food is. Well, here's the definition straight from the dictionary. Substrate that contributes to either the growth or burning of an organism. It's a fine definition. Perfect definition. Substrate that contributes either to the growth or burning of an organism. But what if a substrate does not contribute to growth? What if it actually inhibits growth? What if it hijacks growth to cancer? What if a substrate actually inhibits burning because it inhibits mitochondrial function? Well, then that wouldn't be food, would it? Right. Well, that's exactly what ultra processed food is. It inhibits growth or hijacks it to cancer and it inhibits burning. Therefore, ultra processed food is not food. What is it? If it inhibits those things, it must be poison. Sure. So food as medicine or food as poison. That depends on what you mean by food. Right. When doctors and dietitians and dentists and the food industry and the White House and Congress wake up to this dichotomy, Mm -hmm then maybe we can solve this problem. What would you define as truly processed food? So for example, we can process sausages and they are considered now processed. What is your definition of processed foods? So my definition of processed food is the same as the Nova system, which was developed by my colleague at the University of Sao Paulo, Carlos Montero, okay? Um, Let me give it to you in an easy way for your audience. The NOVA system has four classes. 
Let's take an apple. Class one would be an apple. Class two would be apple slices. Class three would be apple sauce. Class four would be an apple pie. There's nothing wrong with the apple. There's nothing wrong with the apple slices that's been destemmed. So there's a little bit of fiber removal, but it's still an apple. Class three, apple sauce. It's been cooked, possibly sugar added, fiber broken down. And by the time you get to apple pie, it's almost not even recognizable as an apple. Okay. And look at what else has been added to it in order to change its metabolic signature. This is the concept behind ultra processed food. When you look at these four classes, it turns out only the ultra processed food category, only the class four category is related to chronic metabolic disease. Unfortunately, that's 90% of the food. Right. For everything that's in the part four, the section four, is, is there a certain definition to fit that? Is it like a certain cooking temperature? So there are temperature issues. There's also number of ingredients. So one way you can look at it is if you look at the side of a package and there are five ingredients or more, you can be pretty darn sure that's ultra processed food as an example. Okay. If sugar is one of the first three ingredients, that's ultra processed food. In fact, if sugar is any of the ingredients, it's ultra processed because it means that's what they added. The big problem with the NOVA classification is you have to use what's on the label in order to figure it out. Oh, right. And the food processing isn't listed on the label. So if you've removed fiber, that's not on the label. So there are certain rules that, you know, pertain, but aren't necessarily listed that will help you with ultra, pro you know, determine ultra processing. Let me give you an example. Okay. That might be helpful for your audience. A wheat berry has the starch in the center and has the fiber on the outside. There's a wheat berry right there. Okay. If you strip the husk, the fiber off the wheat berry, turns out that was 20 to 25% of the weight, basically five to one. Starch to fiber, five to one. So if you see uh, a, an item in the grocery store, what you need to do is you need to look at the total carbohydrate to fiber ratio. And if that ratio is five to one or less, chances are that that food still has its, the intact fiber associated. If that ratio is seven to one, eight to one, 10 to one, 20 to one, then you know that that fiber has been decimated and has been removed specifically for the purpose of creating that product. Right. In which case that's an ultra processed food. So there are clues to be had on the label. How can you do this easily without having to investigate every label? Well, I'm working with a company that is developing a process and an app to be able to do this for every food in the store very easily. It's called Perfect. I happen to be the chief medical officer, so full disclosure. But that's the whole point, is to be able to understand what's been done to the food, not just what's in the food, because that's ultimately what determines whether the food is healthy or not. In order to be healthy, it needs to do three things protect the liver, feed the gut, support the brain. And if it does those three things, then it's healthy. How will you know? Well, that's where you need perfect. I, I love that. I've never actually heard of food in that way and defining it. You know, it's always normally um, nutrient density or calories and different macros. And it makes sense to say, is this food supporting my liver? Is it supporting my brain? And then is it just supporting my overall health? I mean, those, it, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. Well, it's, it ultimately it's the difference between the food science, nutrition, and metabolic health. Ultimately, 
the only thing that really matters is metabolic health. Food science is what happens to food between the ground and the mouth. Nutrition is what happens between the mouth and the cell. Right. Metabolic health is what happens inside the cell. And that's what counts. So nutrition is, can be listed on the label. Metabolic health does it right now is not listed on the label. It could be, but it's not. And this is what we're trying to overturn. You know, we're trying to have a, shall we say, metabolic health revolution. Sure. We're trying to get metabolic health inserted wherever you would normally say nutrition. I want to kill nutrition. I want to kill the calorie. I want to instead talk about metabolic health as the real arbiter of whether something is good for you or not. I wanted to ask you, um, I kind of glossed over something you mentioned earlier. You said if oranges are from the, if you eat the actual fruit, we're protected from the fiber, but then the juice we're protected by the fiber, by the fibers. And then with juice, I'm guessing it's because some of the fiber is removed, but is orange juice really that much more harmful than like a can of soda? So a can of soda has 1.7 grams of fructose per ounce. A glass of orange juice has 1.8 grams of fructose per ounce. CC for CC, calorie for calorie, ounce for ounce. Sure. Juice is worse than soda. Now, it just so happens that sodas are in cans of 12 ounces and juices are in glasses of eight ounces. So they end up being about the same. But if you drink 12 ounces of juice, you're actually getting more calories and more fructose than the soda. Just playing devil's advocate, there will be people that'll say, well, there's vitamin C in orange juice and it's not the same. It's not as processed and it's, it's whole food form of orange juice. If I were to make my own orange juice, it's just so much more healthier. It's nature's drink. So to that, I have one, one simple meme or credo, if you will. Toxin A plus antidote B still equals death, okay? Let's say you have meningitis, okay? And your doctor knows you have meningitis, but your doctor thinks you have bacterial meningitis and they give you an antibiotic. But it really turns out you had viral meningitis and they didn't give you an antiviral. Are you going to get better? No. Are you going to die? Yeah, you might. Okay. The point is you have to direct your therapy at the pathology. Vitamin C. I'm not saying vitamin C is bad, but vitamin C can't fix the sugar problem. Okay. Sugar is way worse than vitamin C is good. The fact that the juice has vitamin C is kind of irrelevant. And that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It's just, it's so pervasive in our culture that breakfast with orange juice, starting the day with a lot of vitamin C is so good for you. Garbage. Right. And, and then there's people in our community that have been starting to drink orange juice and they truly say for the mineral balance and other things that they just feel so much better when they start adding orange juice. So it's just, it's just interesting because they're probably getting so many hits to their liver. Indeed they are. So I mean, think of it this way. 29% of children in America today are on the national school breakfast program. Right. They get their breakfast at school. And what is the national school breakfast program breakfast? It's a bowl of Fruit Loops and a glass of orange juice. That's what they get. That is 41 grams of sugar, and it's just breakfast. The American Heart Association says that for children, the upper limit of sugar, of added sugar, should be three teaspoons or 12 grams of sugar for the entire day. This is 41 grams of sugar, and it's just breakfast. These kids are being overdosed fourfold. Right. And it's just breakfast. You're still going to tell me that orange juice is okay. Agreed. 
Would you go as far to say that metabolic syndrome and obesity, um, that a big proponent of that is fructose? Metabolic syndrome and obesity are not the same. Right. 20% of obese people are metabolically healthy. Yes. 40% of normal weight people are metabolically ill. Obesity and metabolic syndrome overlap, right. but they are not the same. So what is the cause of metabolic syndrome in normal weight people? Invariably, they have one of two problems. They either have visceral fat from stress or they have liver fat. And it turns out we now know that liver fat is primarily sugar. It's not dietary fat. That is not the cause of liver fat. In fact, the ketogenic diet is the way to remove liver fat. Stress can cause metabolic syndrome. Sugar can cause metabolic syndrome. There are other things that can cause metabolic syndrome too. Alcohol, which is metabolized virtually identically to sugar in the liver. Okay. And trans fats, which line the liver because they can't even be metabolized and cause insulin resistance. Visceral fat, that's stress. And the Whitehall 2 study showed us that very you know, easily. The fact is you can be losing weight and gaining visceral fat. Um, endogenously depressed people actually lose weight because they don't eat, but they increase their visceral fat. And they have metabolic syndrome with weight loss. Right. So anything that causes dysfunctional mitochondria will lead to metabolic syndrome. But sugar is the one that's everywhere. And sugar is the one that the food industry uses as their hook because sugar is the one that's addictive. No one's addicted to stress, but plenty of people are addicted to sugar. Right. Your new book, um, Metabolical, if you could talk a little bit about it, where can people get it? It's half science, half expose. Okay. If this were a Hollywood tome, it would be a kiss and tell, but because it's about diabetes, it's a piss and tell. <laughs> um, you can get it at any bookstore. Mm-hmm. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anywhere else for that matter that sells books. It's got 1,054 references to the primary literature. So you can read this book for knowledge and entertainment, or you can read it for factual, you know, research. I actually hope that this book will be used in medical school to teach, you know, students about nutrition. Okay. And I wrote it with that in mind, but If you want to just understand how you've been hoodwinked, if you want to understand how the food industry has basically played you for a chump for the last 50 years, then this book will explain it. This is a little bit of a random question, but every advocate I've seen that has tried to do an expose on vaccines prior to all of the COVID stuff has gotten in a little bit of heat. Um, even with their colleagues, with all of the research you're doing, that's really against big food, big pharma. Has that impacted your life at all? Well, when I first started talking about this issue back in 2007, mm-hmm. 2009, when I did the YouTube video, Sugar, the Bitter Truth, which yeah. now has like 19 million views, I received a lot of heat okay. from the industry. Oh, Lustig's been thoroughly discredited. He doesn't know what he's right. talking about, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of that. Okay. Fact of the matter is I did know what I was talking about and the science has borne it out. Mm-hmm. And so I'm still standing. Okay. The science is my sword and my shield. Sure. And as long as I stick within the science, which I do, it's very hard to take me down. Okay. Because I don't overstep the science. Sure. Now, having said that, other people are now doing that science. They're also finding the same thing. And there's a whole host of, you know, um, 
scientists that have turned author, mm -hmm. like for instance, Rick Johnson and mm -hmm. David Perlmutter and Peter Atia and a whole bunch of other people who are all, you know, on this on the same page. Gary Taubes is a journalist, but right. you know, has done uh, an enormous. Uh, you know, important job of basically separating the wheat from the chaff in terms of nutrition science. Sure. I'm not alone. The food industry is not attacking me anymore. Now what they're doing is they're running with their tails between their legs, trying to figure out what to do next. I feel like part of what they're trying to do is change the ingredients so that sugar doesn't show up as the first ingredient and mix up all different types of sugars. Or if it's MSG, they're using like the, um, I guess the downstream molecules so that MSG doesn't show up on the packages. So I feel like they're still doing some things that are. Right. Sinister. There's a lot of, there's a lot of subterfuge in the yes. food industry. And I'm very aware of that. Okay. Ultimately that's one of the reasons why, we have to embrace this concept. It's not what's in the food. It's what's been done to the food that right. matters. And that's what should be listed on the package mm -hmm. rather than what's in the food. But that's a heavy lift and we're not there yet. Thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, you have so many good books. I remember the book, The Hacking of the American Mind. There's so much good content. It's easy to understand. And so thank you for all of the research and just helping people try to get better. And if we understand that a lot of just added sugars and these ultra processed foods are causing us to be sick from there, a lot of what I guess within the nutrition and wellness space that we're arguing are little nuances that maybe we should just work as a collective hold. Right. So thank you. So the way I look at it is you can't work downstream of a problem to solve it. You have to work upstream of a problem to solve it. The problem is now very clear. It's our food supply. Right. It's our problem in terms of our health. It's our problem in terms of our environment and sustainability too. We need a new food business model. We need a new food paradigm. And I'm working toward that. Thank you. I mean, even as a nutritionist myself, I feel that the battle is always upstream because when we go to a kid's birthday party, if I don't want my children to have the sugar, I'm the weirdo or I'm the weird one, or I'm the one that's, Oh, let your kids live a little, let them have moderation. And yeah, the problem is problem is there's a birthday party every day. Right. Right. Exactly. And I always wonder, or a holiday every time at school. And I always wonder, will this ever change? Or do we need to start creating these smaller communities where we eat the same way, but the, amazing what you're it, doing. It, it is complicated. Let me, let me just leave your audience with one last concept. Yes. I am for dessert. For dessert. I am not for dessert for breakfast, lunch, snacks, and dinner. Okay. If you make your dessert a good one, have at it and enjoy it. But don't eat your dessert for breakfast. That's good. Thank you so much again. Again, your work is phenomenal and it's helping so many people. So I think, I think after watching your your talk about the bitter truth. It's what made me have my family switch to a more lower carb diet for my parents who were diabetic, hyperinsulinemia, and now they're on zero medication at the age of 70. Fantastic. So thank you so much. Glad to hear. That's great. Um, and where can people find you? Um, and um, I know you just mentioned your books, but is there anywhere well, people can find? I'm easy to find robertlustig.com, metabolical.com, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Judy. Okay, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this interview. I hope that this conversation really gives you some food for thought. I know a lot of times we focus on meat only and we don't really care how processed it is, but sometimes for some people, if we're really unwell, and if we are really trying to reduce metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, it may be beneficial to go with just whole meats and limit some of the processed foods. If our meats tend to have a long ingredient list, oftentimes it may not be the best. Sure, sometimes it's okay, but again, it'll be dependent on your metabolic health. A lot of times I get into conversations with people that say that the food industry or pharma doesn't know what they don't know, or that they don't know that sugar is that harmful. It's interesting to hear from Dr. Lustig blatantly say that they fully know, and it's quite scary. And 
why we should actually reduce our content of processed foods in general. I hope that this conversation provides you another lever to get to root cause healing. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you're listening on a podcast, please make sure to leave a review. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys. Thank you.